step number three. So where do we go when we have the copy mill jig tried in? And if it's adjusted, where do we stand now? Jig goes back to the lab. It gets matrixed. It's silicone. It has wax on it. The wax gets burnt out, and it's injected with acrylic. And what you're converting it to is a full acrylic jig. This is where the CAD portion of the CAD CAM comes in in the lab. What the lab technician will do is they're going to matrix the edges of the teeth to give them a vertical and, a, and also a buccal lingual position to the edge, and then cut it back for the, using the design we talked about earlier with the individual cementable design crown frame. Once that's done, this gets sent off to the production facility of been choosing, and it gets digitized. It essentially is scanned, typically with laser. And what happens is that digital file gets sent to a machine. And this is where the cam portion comes in. You'll get, out of a blank of material, a milled prosthesis return. This one happens to be titanium. But you can have other materials, such as the Strawman Coron, Cobalt Chrome. And the way you can tell the difference between titanium and the cobalt chrome is the titanium has a grayish appearance and the coron a shiny appearance. So with respect to fit passivity, the first fit check is at the lab. So when they do these assessments, they're doing typically what's called a Sheffield test or a one screw test, where a screw is placed into a distal fixture, and the restoration is assessed for rock under a scope. And what, we're, what I'm being told is that they're able to assess fit passivity down to 20 microns or less. In, in Quebec, with BioCAD, they're suggesting that their frames fit to within 8 microns regularly. However, by the same token, they're telling me that it's difficult to assess a frame fit in certain situations, which is why I have these images up. When you have a fixture like the Strawman that has a beveled shoulder as opposed to a disc or a platform, and you have this type of frame design where you have an overlap of the frame on the shoulder, fit passivity is more difficult to assess because they're looking for gaps or spaces between the frame and the implant platform under a scope. So what they want, typically, or what they like, would be something like this. Traditional brand mark, external hex, flat, flat shoulder, or if it's an internal hex, something that's not engaging, or a short engaging component to it, like a Novell Replace, but having a flat platform again. There are other systems like 3i that offer an external hex, BioHorizons that offer an external hex, but there may be some value to considering those systems with multi-unit restorations to allow for a better assessment of the passivity at the level of the lab. So what you're going to get back is going to be a frame. Whether it's titanium, zirconium, or chrome cobalt, it will come back. And then this is an optional appointment, number four. I say it's optional because it depends on your relationship with the lab. If you have a strong relationship with your lab and you value them, you probably want to consider this, especially for large multi-unit restorations, because if there ever was to be an issue with fit impassivity, and I mentioned the numbers earlier, 0.03% is the report coming back from BioCAD, unofficial. If that is the case and the lab fabricates one of these designs with cementable crowns, they may have to go back, refabricate the crowns after they cut the frame and laser weld the titanium, which they can do. If it's zirconium, they have to remake it. So there is some value from that perspective to assessing it at this stage. I use this photo in the comment, these are working screws only, because you have to have a relationship or understanding with your lab with regards to what screws are the permanent screws, the screws that haven't been placed 
into the fixture, whether it's the permanent screws coming back to you in the final case in a package, whether it's the permanent screws coming back to you in the model in the restoration attached to the fixtures. But sometimes there can be some confusion. The lab will send back often the working screws and the permanent. You're trying to determine which one is which. The working screws have added threads to form. That's going to impact the amount of preload that can be applied. It's going to impact the predictability of the torque. It's going to impact the potential for screw loosening. So you have to know or be on the same page with your lab with regards to where the permanent abutment screws are going to be sent back. Now when you get this frame, of course, you can do a few checks with it at this stage. The first one, again, assessing fit. Going back to the copy mill jig stage, if you did the copy mill and you adjusted it if it was necessary, that frame is getting milled and it should be no issue at this stage with fit of the permanent frame. Yes, Tom? Uh, how do you adjust your, your copy mill acrylic, um, we'll say if you're showing a black, a black tissue area that, that you want to cover, do you just add a little bit of uh, flowable or something onto it? Or? Acrylic itself, just have some GC powder resin. Yeah. Liquid in the powder, monomer in the polymer, just mix it up and paint it on. That would be all you have to do, which is one of the, the, the benefits of it. I mean, There's I mean, no preparation of the acrylic, you just add it. Okay, what about mass of aesthetic, like center line off or whatever? Would you take a photograph and let the lab change it and try it in again? Or yes, I wouldn't modify that aspect of it. If it was significantly off, I'd probably go with another try. Most likely, I'd retake the face boat and most likely take another bite record at that stage and remount the whole case and include photos, retracted, facial, so they can see in the face what it looks like and compare it to the articulator mounting once it's remounted. I'd handle it that way. Just because I want, I want to make it easier on myself. I'll book the extra appointment. I won't worry about the time and the cost. I just do it that way, less stress. Minor issues, you can do it yourself. So what you'll find, if you reach the stage without the copy mill prosthesis in these large multi-unit cases, more often than not, you're going to have to adjust. The problem is, as I was saying earlier, it's difficult to determine what's holding up the frame. Is the fact you're dealing with some deeper platforms and the tissue contour is holding it up, the emergence essentially, with the internal, with the abutment aspect of the frame being over-contoured relative to the tissues? Or is it the pontic aspect? We talked about the potential for tissue distortion. And if that occurs, you have to try to identify it. Hard to identify. With this one, it was a little easier. You take off the frame, you got a mark on your tissue. So at least you have some appreciation for where it might be binding. But you want to avoid this because it's hard to adjust by pain. Now with regards to gingival embrasures, we spoke about this too. Copy mill offers you the benefit of being able to try in the prosthesis See if you can get a bridge aid through, a glide floss aid through, super floss through, whatever you plan on using, before you hit this stage with titanium. Because now, it's really difficult to create V-shaped grooves between the fixtures. You've got to rely on diamond discs. You know, that's hard to do, and you have to polish that. Really, there's no polishing tool to allow you to get in there so easily and polish those grooves. You're trying to keep the embrasure small so food doesn't get in. It's a balancing act, but not too big Okay, because it's going to impact the aesthetics negatively, potentially. And in the wrong person, the demanding person, they may start pointing at these open and gingival embrasures, and that could potentially define the difference between success and failure from an aesthetic perspective. So you want to be able to do that. One aspect you can do as well, assess the inner arch space. Frame goes in, and you're assessing whether or not you have enough clearance. What you're looking for is gross discrepancies. Frame goes in, they bite down, they're biting on the frame. Now you have a problem. And this stems back to the use of the implant-supported bite jigs with, with regards to getting a, a more accurate record as opposed to the removable bite blocks. Use a removable bite block, large implant case on a fixed frame like this one, greater risk that you're not going to get an accurate relationship between the maximal and the mandible, greater risk you're going to get potential issues with the frame being in contact. So now if you were at this stage, you didn't do the copy mill, you didn't assess the occlusion, you're forced to take this off and start grinding down titanium. 
and then take another byte record. So in, in, in a sense, you're working backwards a little bit. So you're trying to avoid these types of things. And then lastly, we talked about the value of the verification aspect of the copy mill jig. Same thing this time with the permanent. You want to be able to take films, again, assess the connection <coughs> between the fixture and the abutment, as we showed earlier, use the tactile test we talked about, and rely on the thread clarity to determine how accurate your films are relative to orientation of the fixtures, to give you some appreciation for how passive or impassive the frame fits. Now, lab step number four. Because we have titanium, we talked about titanium oxidation in the oven, we want to keep it out. We have a metal frame, no different than gold. We want it to look pretty. We need to mask out the metal. Typically, if it's gold alloy, it goes back in the oven with an opaquer on it. We can't do that. So we rely on a product called Link, which is a metal adhesive. Five minutes set on the frame. The lab will then paint on a light cured resin opaquer. Keeps it out of the oven, eliminates the issue with the titanium oxidation at the interface of the abutment, so we don't have to deal with polishing that off and deal with the frame misfit potential. Then if there's a soft tissue aspect to your frame, you have to decide, is it going to be porcelain? Is it going to be composite? How do we decide? A lot of the work is coming out of Atlanta, with David Garber's group, pushing for, for, for composite. But there's sort of a back and forth in, this, in terms of this aspect. Some technicians are suggesting porcelain, others suggesting composite. Everybody has an opinion, there's no science. But I can tell you this, those that suggest composite recommend it primarily because of the ability to repair. Primarily because if there's any misfit issues with the tissue, i.e. you didn't do a copy mill jig to assess how accurate your impression was, to see if that copy mill jig fits intimately with the tissue, you can go back later and bond to the composite. Now, I would argue that this probably isn't the most predictable procedure, depending on whether that composite is going to be supported or unsupported, but you can do it. Micro etch it, put adhesive on, take pink composite, and layer it, light cure it. You can make little corrections, or you can make larger corrections. So, there is that potential, but I would contend that it's something that you wouldn't be doing on a regular basis, and probably alone is not going to be sufficient enough to warrant using composite. There's got to be other reasons. So, what the labs will tell me, for those that use composite, they like the fact that better range of colors in course. They like the fact that the composite gives them more of a matte finish, a more of a natural gum finish, as opposed to the glossy porcelain which you may have all seen, doesn't look so great. It gives an ability to be able to define the contours of the tissue. So little details in trying to